few years ago, I was sharing the gospel at a camp, which is definitely one of my favorite things to do. And one of the evenings, as we were just kind of hanging out, one of the students came up to me and a couple of the other leaders, and they said, you know, I don't believe in God, but could you pray for me? (laughs) There's something inside of all of us, just like a baby that looks for his mother. There's something inside our spirit that longs for God who created us. And it comes so natural, even when those who might claim they don't believe in God, but find themselves in a time of need, cry out to someone out there, help. That person is God. And he put that desire in our hearts that we know that he is there in the deepest and most part of our beings, and our spirits cry out to him in prayer. And so though prayer comes so naturally at the same time, it's one of the hardest things in the Christian walk to stay consistent with, because most of the time, it's something that happens between you and God, and nobody else knows if you've been praying or not. If there's one area that I could really make you feel guilty about this morning. It's prayerlessness, because I could do the same to myself. But these stories that we see today encourage us in our prayer life by showing us what the prayers of the righteous look like. You know, if you want to pray in a way that is acceptable to God and that he loves to hear, we find it in this passage today. And so when your heart does cry out, you know that you have a God who cares. And so we are going to learn from these three stories, things about prayer. And and there's a pattern that I see that I'm going to mention in each one of the stories of four things, a pattern of four things. That number one, there's an outsider who you wouldn't expect to be accepted by God or cared for that is the one who's praying. In the book of Luke, the insignificant, the needy, the helpless, the poor, the oppressed are the ones who end up becoming those that are exalted by Jesus Christ. And so here we see a a widow, a tax collector, sinner, and infants. So we see the outsider, and then secondly, we'll see that each of them has an adversary. The widow has an unrighteous um, adversary that's giving her troubles. That's why she's crying out to the judge. The, the, the tax collector, his adversary is the Pharisee, the religious guy. And then the infants, their adversary is, are the disciples, which is unexpected. The third thing we'll see in each one of these stories is that there's a righteous prayer quality that Christ is encouraging us to take upon ourselves as we approach the Lord in prayer. The first example, we'll see persistence, continuing to pray. The second example, we'll see this penitent heart, the acknowledgement that we're in need of God's mercy. And then lastly, a childlike faith. So that righteous prayer quality. And then lastly, we'll see God's response to each one of these people and how he comes through. So as we're preparing to look at each one, keep that outline kind of in your mind, those four things we'll see in each example. And so first, we're going to look at the persistent prayer in verses 1 through 8. It says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. To always pray pray. A continual habit of prayer, not a non-stop so much as that it's something that is part of your life continually. In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, pray without ceasing. You know, when you're dating your spouse, I don't know if you guys ever did the phone call where you're like on the phone and you don't want to hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. <laughs> that prayer would be kind of like that. You know, you just don't want to stop talking. And when I was 
dating my wife and then got in, engaged. I was at Bible college down in Portland and she was up in Silverdale. And uh, it was back then that uh, I had to save up a bunch of coins in order to call her. So I kept this jar full of quarters and dimes and nickels and we had a payphone in our dorm. And so I have to go to that thing and feed the payphone and then make the phone call. And then 10 minutes in, your time's about to run out. And I'm like, oh, oh money, <laughs> to try to keep it up. So with that same sort of excitement and desire that we would pray always and not stop, that we wouldn't lose heart, not get discouraged, not let disappointment take hold. Why? Because in the last section we looked at, at the end of verse se or chapter 17, it was talking about Christ's return and alluding that there may be a delay. In that delay, hard times come. There will be persecution and tribulation, and we'll have to put up with the effects of sin on this earth and sickness of our bodies and so on and so on. Um, and it's easy to lose heart when we get discouraged. But, as it says in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And so that encouragement to continue, even though times are tough, don't lose heart. If you're a warrior on the battlefield, one of the worst things you could do is lose heart because you're going to get wiped out if you start running, if you give way to cowardice, but to stay brave and face what is in front of you, don't lose heart. Keep praying. In verse two, it goes on. He, and he said, and here's his parable, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and I, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. The outsider in this parable is the widow. In that day, to be a widow was scary because it was the man who provided in, in those days, in those hard times. Widows were usually poor, vulnerable. No one was there to defend her cause. No one to stand up for her, to protect her. She couldn't afford to pay a bribe. People would take advantage of widows. And here, there's some adversary. We're not told the situation, but she's being treated unjustly, being persecuted or whatever, and it's causing her major pain. So she goes to the judge to ask for help. Now, the adversary, as you first read it, you might think is the judge, but it's actually um, the person giving her a hard time. This word adversary means an accuser or an opponent in a lawsuit. We're not sure what it is, but it's an unjust situation. She doesn't deserve it. She's being treated shamelessly. And this kind of treatment to widows is actually condemned in Scripture. In Deuteronomy 27, 19, it says, Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, or the alien in your land, um, the fatherless and the widow. And all the people shall say amen. Cursed is anyone who does that. And so, just the fact that this story follows what we read about last time, the end times and the persecution coming, it hints at the injustice that we will experience as the followers of Christ. There will be adversaries in this world. And 
trials and tribulations. So this widow appeals to the unrighteous judge. And so we see through this continual asking the unrighteous judge for help, the, the righteous prayer quality of persistence, not losing heart, staying strong, continuing to pray, and to not get self-pitiful, oh, God's not coming through, I'm going to stop praying. But rather, like it says here, cry to him day and night. Do you persevere in prayer? There's a lot of things that would cause us to want to give up. But this widow is not discouraged. Even with an unrighteous judge, she just keeps coming back, even though she, he keeps denying her. But eventually, notice, we see God's response to that righteous prayer quality in the negative example of the righteous judge as a contrast. So check this out. This judge that dealt with civil cases and often financial issues um, didn't care enough to give this woman justice because he didn't care about people and he didn't care about God. So the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbors yourself, um, he, he didn't follow those commands. So he was not a righteous guy. He was an unrighteous judge. But he answers her request because of personal inconvenience. What a selfish guy. You know, he starts getting sick of this lady coming by every day. And he even says, you know, I'm getting beat down by her requests. And literally that means to blacken the eye. Um, so whether he's looking bad in the eyes of others or he's just getting, uh, you know, emotionally tired by this lady, um, he finally responds with justice just because of selfishness. So how does this show us about God? Well, Jesus tells stories like this of negative examples and then leads into, if so, with an unrighteous judge, how much more God, who is righteous, will he listen to your prayer and actually care about you? And he will actually answer your prayer, not selfishly, not because he gets tired of you, but because he cares. Sometimes we don't get exactly what we ask for. Just like a child asking their father for something that's not good for them, sometimes dads say no. And, you know, I hate saying no to my kids, but I don't mind doing it when it's for their protection, you know, when they don't understand that uh, something could hurt them. Sometimes God says no. And we continue to pray, and through that process, he oftentimes would change our hearts as we continue to pray for that thing that he doesn't want us to have. I believe God begins to shape and mold your desire through persistent prayer for the thing he does want you to have. He prepares you for just the right time to come through for that request. Prayers not about getting our will done on earth, but God's will. So, God will not keep putting you off, even though the answer might be no. He's got something better. Even though the answer might be wait, have persistence, and it will be good when it comes through. He cares, though, in the meantime for your needs and your hurts. In Deuteronomy 10, 17 8 through 18, it says, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial, takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Our God is just, but he also cares for the outsider. When nobody else cares about you and you feel insignificant, our God, his heart beats for you. His heart longs for you. In Psalm 56, verse 8, we see this great verse that reminds us of God's care 
about the little things. You have kept count of my tossings in bed at night because of the worries and the thoughts that keep you awake. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? And he keeps track of every one of those tears. That's the kind of God we have. So remember the unrighteous judge who comes through because of inconvenience, our God, how much more does he care about our prayer? And then it ends with, nevertheless, will the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And so again, alluding to last, the last section of the end times, we're waiting for Christ to return. He ascended into heaven after his resurrection, and his return is imminent. Any moment, any time, like a thief in the night, he can return. When he comes, he said, will I find faith? Literally, it's the faith. Will I find the faith on the earth? Which, uh, one commentary says this, the use of the article before faith, the, the faith, suggests that this question should be translated, will he find the faith rather than will he find faithfulness? Will he find Christianity alive and well when he returns? Will he find a vibrant church when he returns, standing, persevering, even though we have adversaries that are giving us a heck of a time? There will be a time of spiritual decline before Christ returns. In Matthew 24, verse 12, it says, And because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. There will be this falling away. There will be this lack of love in the last days. Persecution will ensue and evil and injustice will begin to flourish if it hasn't already, as you've noticed. But we should continue to pray and not lose heart. And that is tied to the faith being active and vibrant when Christ returns. Is your faith going to be strong and alive no matter what kind of persecution comes? Prayer is a key to staying strong. When an adversary is treating you unjustly, Christ gives us an example of what to do. I mean, he was, he was arrested unjustly. He was condemned unjustly and crucified unjustly. He was perfect in every way. He was sinless. Yet in 1 Peter 2, 23, it says, when he was reviled, when they were casting slurs on him and spitting on him and hitting him, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. God, our righteous judge, no matter what you're going through, if you entrust yourself to him. And even if you suffer for a time, he will come through for you like this teaching tells us. Persist in prayer and faithfulness and he will act speedily. You can trust in his promises, his character, and his presence. And so we continue to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. So persistent prayer. The second example we see here is penitent prayer. In verses 9 through 14, it says, And he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Don't you love to hang around self-righteous people? <laughs> so much fun to hear their, their uh, contempt for people. They're complaining about everybody else. This Pharisee that we're going to read about in this story is indicative of some of the people that were in the crowd that Jesus was talking to. And he said this for their sake at first, that they trusted in themselves, which means they thought they could earn their salvation by being good enough. Before I became a Christian, I 
was convinced in my own heart, just by my own reasonings, and I don't know where I picked it up, but I thought that one day, when I die, I'll stand before God, and there will be some huge cosmic scales, and all of my bad works will be on one side, and the good works will be on the other, and I just hope when it goes to balance that my good works outweigh the bad. And so in my mind, that was what salvation was before I met Jesus. And so these folks trusted in themselves in that way that they would have enough good works to be saved, to be accepted by God. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous, it says. But the problem is, Scriptures tell us that no one is righteous. Check this out. In Romans 3.10, as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Wow. Reveal something about human nature that we're depraved. These folks didn't see their own sinful hearts. And isn't that the problem with self-righteous people? They didn't see their need for a Savior. If you're tempted to trust in your own good works, thinking that they're actually good, the Bible reveals to us not only are we not righteous, but even when we try to do good, the good that we do is not acceptable to God. In Isaiah 64, verse 6, it says, we all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. So even when we try to do good, we're we're tainted so that our good works are even polluted. So, The self-righteous have no place to stand before God. Nothing we can do will earn God's acceptance. But notice how they treat other people. They treated others with contempt because of how they saw themselves. They become critical and condemning of everybody else around them. That's a sure sign of an unredeemed heart, of an unsaved person, is judgmental, critical condemning towards others. In verse 10, now the parable to illustrate what is the right way to approach God. It says, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The outsider in this prayer story is the tax collector. They were understood by Israel as a whole to be the sinners of the worst kind. Because they were corrupt in how they took taxes from people, they were usually rich because they took more than they needed to take. They were seen as supporting the Roman occupiers, and so people hated these tax collectors. They took advantage of their fellow Israelites. And so when he approaches God, he knows the wrong that he's done, Over the years, he feels the guilt and the shame. And so, notice his first, the first picture of him is he stands at a distance. His physical stance reveals a gap between him and God, a broken relationship. He knew he he was a sinner, which is an important thing to know. And he beat his breast. He wouldn't even lift up his eyes, which reveals his shame. Didn't feel even un- he didn't even feel worthy to look up. But his adversary, the Pharisee, 
The Pharisee is part of a Jewish group that followed a careful observance of the law. Uh, they were like the religious athletes of their day. People would cheer them on and watch them with their great feats of righteousness, you know, making great um, sacrifices and, and praying these amazing prayers publicly. And people would be like, wow, I wish I could pray like that. It sounds so cool. He's standing by himself, you know, up front and center before everybody else. And he's praying, reciting his moral resume, <laughs> advertising his righteousness in front of others that they might applaud him. Now he claims to have done more than even what the law required. He fasted twice a week, which there was only one day a year that the Israelites were required to fast. But he fasted twice a week. Uh, Mondays and Thursdays was a tradition of the Pharisees. Tithing everything that he could think of tithing. And Jesus kind of makes fun of this in uh, Luke eleven forty two. 42. But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb. So imagine tithing all of your um, spices in your spice rack. Yeah, that's a little overkill, right? Um, these you ought to have done without neglecting the others um, of justice and the love of God. So he claims to be following the law and to be going beyond the law. And he, man, he's just so righteous. And then if that's not enough, he points out the sinful tax collector. Ouch. He's not so much praying now as speaking to anyone that could hear him. He starts off praising God. Thank you, God. Oh, that sounds pretty good. That I'm not like other men, you know. Oops. He ended up praising himself at the end. In Proverbs 21, 29, it says, A wicked man puts on a bold face, but the upright gives thought to his ways. So the outsider, the tax collector, displayed a righteous prayer quality that was this. He was penitent or repentant. While the widow appealed to justice because she was in the right and being mistreated, she was praying that she got the justice she deserved. The tax collector, on the other hand, is appealing to God's mercy because he's in the wrong. And he's praying that he doesn't get what he deserves. This penitence, the willingness to admit that he's a sinner and to confess it before the Lord is a necessary quality if you want to approach God in prayer. In Psalm 34, 18, it says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The prayer that is acceptable to God begins with a sinner that is aware of his need for God's mercy. If you're saved by grace, if you've been able to approach God because of his mercy, you'll find it difficult to despise others, to show others with contempt or to become judgmental. Because we can't even boast in our own righteousness, let alone put others down for the lack of theirs. Humility towards God and compassion towards others is a sign of true righteousness. <laughs> that somebody's life's truly been changed by God. So as we think of this righteous prayer quality of being penitent, let's thank God we're not like this Pharisee. Oh, wait, <laughs> that's exactly what we're not supposed to do, right? Uh, remember that sometimes we are like that Pharisee, right? Confess it. Surrender before the Lord. In verse 14, Jesus shows us God's response. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So it's kind of a, really a surprise response 
for the crowd. It might not be so much for us in our day because in a lot of minds, we think of the Pharisees as the bad guys and um, we just kind of expect that. But in Christ's day, everybody saw the Pharisees as the good guys, that they earned the right to be in God's kingdom. Yet this Pharisee didn't go home justified and people were like, what? How's that possible? God's response was to send the sinner home justified because he sought God's mercy. He was not just forgiven. He was justified, which means he was given a new standing before God. To be justified is to be declared as if, as if you've never sinned before. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Think of it that way. Justified. Just as if I've never sinned. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. To be justified means that somebody else took your place of punishment. And that person was Jesus Christ. When he hung on the cross, he died in your place. Because scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. Hell. Christ died for your sin on the cross. He took it upon himself. And it says here, he became sin. And then there's this exchange that happens when you admit your need and you call out upon Jesus for salvation in God's mercy, you become the righteousness of God. Justified. That is amazing. Forgiven, yes, but also a change of standing before God that now when he looks at you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's like he took off an old dirty set of clothes and put on you a brand new suit or a brand new dress, just clean and immaculate. We're clothed in Christ. And that's how we can enter God's presence. And that's how salvation occurs. It's by nothing we do, but by everything he's already done on the cross for us. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, it says in Scripture. When you call on his name, forgive me, a sinner. Have mercy on me. Jesus, save me. He will meet you where you're at. But if you try to stand in your own righteousness and prove to God how good you are and why he should let you into to heaven, <laughs> we're rejected. There is no justification in ourselves. So one day there is this great reversal coming. And Christ speaks of it. The great reversal. Humble yourself now and you'll be lifted up. Or you could try to exalt yourself now in pride like this Pharisee. And then you will be humbled in the future one day. This penitence, this humility that we should have in prayer, Jesus actually sets for us the example of the attitude of humility when he came to this earth. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, in being found in human form, God became man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, which was a shameful way to die. Not even Roman citizens were crucified. It was too low for them. But Jesus became a man. He died a lowly, shameful death. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father in humility, we follow in his footsteps. And you'll see that humility in the way we approach God in prayer. We'll see it in the way that we treat others who are sinners. In 1 Peter 5.5, 5, we're told, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. 
To be humble is where it's at in the kingdom of God. To be humble here is that idea of contrition, penitence, repentance. James 4, 8 through 10 says, draw near to God and he'll run the other way. No. (laughs) Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. So you see this great reversal that occurs when we confess our sins as sinners and then call upon his mercy. He justifies us and we have a new standing before God and we become the righteousness of God. It's an amazing thing. That's the good news. That's the gospel. And we're here today because of that mercy that God has given us. Well, the last example we see of prayer here is childlike prayer in verses 15 through 17. It says, now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So it seems a little weird to call the infants outsiders, but they are the outsiders in this story. The babies. In Greco-Roman society, children were regarded as insignificant. And that's the way people saw it, you know, to be seen and not heard. Children are helpless, independent. They often go unnoticed, without status. Their hands are empty like a beggar. <laughs> they need their parents for everything. And if you have a little kid, you know <laughs> that very well right now. You know, you're needed all the time. Even when you're in the bathroom, you know, the little fingers come under the door and, <laughs> Mama! So, the outsiders, the babies. Now, it's really surprising that the disciples are the adversaries. They're concerned about the dignity of the ministry. Jesus is too important to be bothered by these insignificant ones. The stinky kids with the dirty diapers. Years ago, when I was trying to work at home, and when we were first planting this church, and Marianne is a nurse, so she would work as a nurse, and I'd be working at home, watching our four kids, and, and they were like, not in school yet, And as I'm trying to work, I'm getting irritated because kids are like climbing on me and toys are hitting the keyboard of my computer and stuff. And I'm thinking how most men, most respectable men are out working, (laughs) manly jobs. And here I am stuck with these brats, you know. (laughs) If you're a man, you'll understand if you've ever done that, you know. But God reminded me of Christ's attitudes towards kids. Oh, man, don't remind me of that. (laughs) You know, I miss those days now, but it was hard during the time. The disciples were having a hard time. These manly men, they were like, get these kids out of here. Got to remember who they were, fishermen, roughnecks, you know, manly guys. But the righteous quality of prayer we see is a childlike faith, a simple trust. So much so that even the infants, um, they weren't necessarily even asking to see Jesus. It was their parents bringing them. They were totally dependent. And, And as kids are, they had trust. They approached with boldness, complete dependence, not pompous. Like, check me out, Jesus in my diapers, you know, (laughs) with my new tooth coming in. (laughs) I've never met a prideful baby that thought he was hot stuff, you know. Um, I think of my kids when they were younger, and we used to have a family suburban, and they'd be in their car seats, 
and uh, we have some kind of music playing. We didn't really play like the kitty music. We'd play like, you know, cool Christian stuff, you know, and they, <laughs> the kids loved it. And so we'd be driving along and the windows down, summertime, sippy cup in hand, wind, or a little bit of hair blowing in the wind, and kick, feet kicking, having a good time, a little snack on the side, enjoying life. No worries. They're not like, hey, uh, dad, you going the speed limit? You know? They're just along for the ride and they're having a good time. Childlike faith is like that. Trusting your heavenly father who's at the wheel to just take you where he needs to take you. And when you come to him in prayer, there's just that simple trust, the simple faith. Not having it all worked out in your own mind, not telling God how he's going to do things, but rather just coming to him and saying, God, I need you. In one commentary, it points out this. Uh, Kent Hughes says, what is the ontological distinctive of a newborn? Helplessness. Jesus has in mind here the objective state that every child who has ever lived, regardless of race, culture, or background, has experienced, namely, helpless dependence. A newborn, naked, with flailing hands and feet, lifted toward the sky, is a heart-wrenching profile of helplessness. And unlike any other creature, its helplessness extends for years. No child would survive its earthly, early years without the help of others. Edward Schweitzer, professor of the New Testament at the University of Zurich, wrote, But this is the reason they are blessed. Just because they, the little children, have nothing to show for themselves. They cannot count on any achievements of their own. Their hands are empty like those of a beggar. Jesus enlarges the promise to include everyone with an authority such as only God can claim. He promises the kingdom to those whose faith resemble the empty hand of a beggar. Such faith is possible because they have no achievements of their own, nor conceptions of God which can intrude between them and God. And so what's God's response? When we come to him in helplessness, in total dependence, God is happy to take care of our needs and meet us where we're at. And so he takes these children into his arms and he touches them, which is like the idea of laying his hands on them and blessing them and praying for them. Now that's a child dedication right there. Jesus enjoyed the children, and he ministered to them. <laughs> but he also defended them. He rebuked the disciples because of their attitude. And he accepts these helpless children who have nothing to offer into the kingdom because of their simple faith. If you want to be part of God's kingdom, it starts with that just simple trust, nothing to offer and you might not have all the answers. You might not understand all the scriptures or be theologically versed in any way, shape, or form. But if you come to him, he will take care of it. And so when we pray with a childlike faith, it's powerful. This last year, I experienced that not by choice, but by um, involuntary uh, experience of life, you know, with cancer and the removal of my spleen, which I'm still waiting for an operation to fix that. But uh, <laughs> having to be in that place where you're like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Or, you know, I, I don't want to eat any food. Or I'm in a lot of pain. Um, brought me, at least, to that place. And I know many of you have been there in life where even if you tried to run away, you can't escape <laughs> from whatever it is you're facing. You're helpless. 
And so what better thing to do than just surrender and then pray to the Lord, God, I need your help. Or to learn to just rest and be still in his arms. That childlike faith is powerful. That's that righteous quality God responds to. Well, as we conclude, I want to ask these questions. Which, which adversaries to prayer in your life have kept you from praying? If you've experienced a season of prayerlessness, what are the adversaries in your life that are keeping you from that? You know, and for the widow, it was this person giving her a bad time, but she chose to persist. And for the tax collector, it was a Pharisee who was judging him, but he prayed for mercy. And then for the children, it was the disciples saying, hey, we're too dignified for you. But they were brought to Jesus anyway, and he took care of them. He defended them. There's all sorts of adversaries to prayer in our lives, and whether it be injustice or impatience or self-righteousness or pride or whatever. What is the adversary? Identify it so that you can resist it. But also, on the flip side, which heroes of faithful prayer could encourage you as you look to the Scriptures for examples or in your life? Maybe you have had a grandma that has been praying for you from the time you were born and still prays for you every day. <laughs> How cool is that? Sometimes we forget the riches of the people God has placed in our lives because they're praying for us. Which heroes of faithful prayer, you know, like the widow, that you could follow her example, or the tax collector, maybe you can relate with him more. Or the infant is helpless. Or others. You know? Find the, those examples that can, can encourage you. And so, three things I would encourage you to do in response to this message today. Number one is return to praying for what God put on your heart. Because of discouragement, because we lost heart, we stopped praying for some, somebody or something. And God's gently reminding you this morning. Return to praying for that thing I put on your heart. Don't give up. Persist in it. Start today. Write it on a piece of paper and put it in your Bible. Or put it on a sticky note and on your mirror in the morning so when you're getting ready, you see that prayer request. Secondly, pray confidently, remembering it's by grace you stand. You know, though the tax collector stood afar off and beat his chest, he did receive justification in that truth that we are forgiven and giving it a new status before God should give us an openness to approach the Lord without being afraid. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you've been accepted by God and you have peace with God through Christ, you can enter the throne room with confidence, which doesn't mean pride, like who's the man, you know, walking into the Lord's presence, but rather confidence, like the Lord loves you and he wants to hear your request. And you will receive mercy and grace. But we realize it's by grace that I stand. It's by the blood of Christ that I can be here. And that's why when we pray in Jesus' name, that's what that means, that we have put our faith in Christ and it's through him we have access to the Father. And then thirdly, simply trust in your heavenly Father to take care of you. Because sometimes that's all you got. And you're in that place. And you just need to surrender and relax in his arms. And whatever he's got planned, that he's going to take care of you. He's got a plan for you. 
So some great reminders of prayer. Why don't we turn to the Lord in prayer as we close? If you're in a place today like that tax collector and you need the mercy of God, pray this prayer in your heart. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and dying for my, cro- my sin on the cross. Thank you for taking my unrighteousness upon yourself. And I call out on your name, Jesus Christ, Son of God, save me, a sinner. Thank you for your righteousness that you gift me with, that I am now justified because of my faith in you. Help me to follow you all my days. Lord, for all of us, as our spirits cry out for our maker, that you would teach us these amazing truths about prayer. Grow us deeper, grow us further, and pray that you would do amazing things in our midst as we turn to you in prayer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.